The season was changing and marked the approach of our journey's completion. Even though the bright warm days of summer were gone, the onset of winter brought a unique experience. The contrast of orange leaves and white snow, the cold air and a hot campfire. Each season brings a unique perspective that cannot be seen any other time of year. And we intended to soak it all up in our last few weeks, despite the cooler weather. So you might recognize where we are today. We left Whitehorse, Yukon last night and drove a couple of hours here to Johnson's Crossing and we stayed the night at the entrance to the South Canole Road. We haven't been here for four months. Uh, first time we were here was at the start of our journey. It looks a bit different. A couple of seasons have come and gone since then. And it's crazy to think that we are back here making our way south towards the end of our journey now. We fortunately did not have any porcupine incidents on this go around. We were heading south and retracing our steps along the Alaska Highway, but only as far as the junction with Highway 37, just outside Watson Lake, known as the Stuart Cassier Highway. This highway is the only alternative road one can take when making the drive to Alaska, so we figured, why not see it? <laughs> it doesn't feel like a highway. Shortly down the road, we said goodbye to the Yukon and entered back into British Columbia for the remainder of this highway. Being narrow, lacking road lines, and feeling a bit like a roller coaster at times, the Cassier was a more adventurous drive than we had experienced along the Alaska Highway. We poked our way south, taking our time and making a few stops here and there. But aside from a few forest roads and picnic areas, we did not find much to explore along the northern stretch of this road until we came to Boyle Lake Provincial Park. Only a short drive off the highway, we came to a well-developed campground along the lake. We pulled into a spot to make some lunch and hike along the beautiful lake shore. We could see the waters of this lake were very clear, but it wasn't until the sun came out that we realized this lake is some kind of spectacular. The bottom of this lake is a stark white marl of silt and shell fragments that reflect light through the immensely clear water, creating a spectacular color one would expect to see somewhere in the tropics, far from this northern plain. Along our hike, the trail took us by a small sink with some standing water. Upon investigating this, I discovered a very peculiar trait to the ground. This little pond here, this ground, whatever this muck is that it's formed has covered in grass. It feels like walking on rubber. It literally feels like walking on a trampoline. It's super bouncy. This phenomenon is called soil liquefaction, where the water-saturated loose soil underneath the grass loses its stiffness when an outside stress like walking on it is applied. After our tropical-like hike and the trampoline shoreline, we decided this place would require more than a stop for lunch, and we settled in here for a night. This gave Kate some time to get out the paddleboard and properly explore these waters. So 
So today turned out to be a gorgeous day on Boya Lake. I think they renamed this uh, provincial park to its original, um, more native name, but it's just gorgeous no matter what you call it. The, the water is unreal. It looks like we should be in the tropics. So had to get the paddleboard out and come for a paddle. But I never get cold when it's you I hold When the fire burns down and the embers slow We enjoyed an extremely peaceful evening here as there were very few other campers in the park. As the sun set, we hoped for clear night skies, and sure enough, when we forced ourselves awake at 2 a.m., we caught the splendor we had hoped to see, the northern lights over this beautiful lake. The next morning, we awoke to a seaplane taxiing along the water. We could only imagine what flying over and landing on this lake must be like, as even the satellite imagery of this place is stunning. Back on the highway, we started getting into the mountains. These high peaks were counting down to winter, day by day as the snow marched down their flanks. The weather changed rapidly around each mountain, and we found ourselves in a downpour when we came upon the famous Jade City. While not officially a city, this spot along the road lies within the Cassier Mountain Range, where massive amounts of jade are mined and processed. This green mineral can be carved into furnishings and adornments of many shapes and sizes, and here you can have your pick. The roadfront store houses more jade than we had ever seen. This jade mining operation is a family affair, and their stories have even been chronicled in a reality TV show with the title, Jade Fever. Continuing south, we were presented with spectacular mountain views and made a few stops to take it all in. More than once, the temperature dipped near freezing, and we even saw a snowflake or two. This drive requires that you carry chains or run winter tires from October through April, and that meant we needed to keep moving because September was nearing its end, and we had neither of these. We took a few days to make the 600-kilometer drive, finding a few boondocking spots along the way. This road and corridor were mainly constructed to facilitate resource extraction from the region, including mining and logging, and it was completed in the 1970s. Toward the southern end of the road, we started to see more signs of human development, and the road widened. It was clear that future development is expected as a modern transmission line began to follow our route south. When we reached the town of Mesiaden Junction, we turned to the west to follow Highway 37A that would snake through a tight valley to the town of Stewart, BC. Like Skagway and Haines, Alaska that we had visited before, Stewart sits at the end of a long fjord and serves as Canada's most northerly ice-free port. Stewart also borders the southern panhandle of Alaska, and by snaking along the shore of the fjord, one can make the southernmost land crossing into Alaska. There is no U.S. border crossing checkpoint here, and we drove right into the small town of Hyder, Alaska. As it was now late September, this sleepy little town was shutting down and no stores were open, but we weren't here to shop. We continued following the main road up the Salmon River Valley and made our first stop at the Fish Creek Wildlife Observation Site. This site would complete our experience of the salmon's life cycle that we had seen over the course of our trip. 
First, when fishing in Valdez, we saw and caught the beautiful ocean-going salmon, then saw them again at the Solomon Gulch fish hatchery, making their way from the ocean upstream while their bodies morphed and changed color. Later in Katmai, we witnessed them pairing up and guarding their nests in riverbeds while hungry bears picked them off. At this stage, they had quit eating and were protecting their nests as their bodies began to deteriorate. Yeah, a little late for the salmon run. Now, here, the spawn was over and the creek was littered with the last of the carcasses that had either fallen prey to the bears or finally run out of energy. So we're here a little bit late, but this is probably just like what we saw out at Katmai when we did the bear viewing. In the height of the run, the bears are probably all just staked along this river eating the salmon. And there's no bears right now because all the salmon are dead, but you can just imagine all the people here to see the bears. That would be pretty cool. What do you think of that smell? Oh, the smell is awful. The smell is awful. Just all these dead fish still in the water and on the banks. It's, ugh. be glad you can't smell through the video. <laughs> While quite disgusting and smelly, this life and death cycle is an essential part of the ecosystem here. The nitrogen and phosphorus that the fish bring from the ocean helps to fertilize the riverbanks and keep the impressive trees here healthy, that in turn provide shelter and water filtration for the next generation of salmon that will hatch here in the spring. We are driving up the Salmon River in Hyder, Alaska. Our goal is to see the Salmon Glacier. The road continues further up the valley, turns to dirt, then starts climbing the steep cliffside. This is a mining road that has been used over the years to access the gold and copper mines of the region. As we started to ascend the mountainside, we noticed that the steep climb was burning more fuel than we expected, and we were hoping to make it another 20 miles further up the road and back. Having made the mistake of not fueling up on our way through Stewart, and there being no fuel in Hyder, we sheepishly turned around and crossed back into Canada to fill up. The Canadian border crossing does have a checkpoint, but being that nothing was open in Hyder, the crossing was easy. After filling up and heading back into Alaska, we found an old gravel pit to make our home for the night. The next morning we went at it again, this time fully expecting the steep grade. The thing about this road is that it only dips into Alaska and all the mines are actually back up the mountain in Canada. And shortly up the road, we cross back into British Columbia with nothing more than a sign along the road saying welcome to BC. The road was not in great condition and a very, very rough ride but we plied forward, avoiding the potholes as best we could, climbing further and further up the mountainside. After ascending a few thousand feet, the road opened up and will make anyone with a fear of heights uncomfortable with its sheer drops and no guardrail. <laughs> Aside from being an industrial road, this drive provides one of the best views of a massive glacier descending from a high elevation ice field. This is the Salmon Glacier, and a designated viewpoint aligned with the center of the glacier is the reward for those willing to make this treacherous journey. After checking out the viewpoint, we continued further down the road towards the end. An old tunnel tempted us at one point, but strange noises coming from its depths and warning signs turned us away. Listen to that. Sounds like there's a dragon in there. We did find some old abandoned mining areas and two tracks that led down towards the glacier. We parked the truck and started our hike down the mountain slope to get close to this behemoth of a glacier.
This glacier is unique in that as it descends, it flows mainly towards the ocean, but also makes a turn into a dead-end valley where it breaks up. We found that hiking in this area was less steep, and we worked our way down the slope of loose rocks towards the ice. It happened to be my birthday, and I couldn't think of a better way to spend it than hiking around the remote Salmon Glacier on this beautiful, warm fall day. You'd think that for a big hunk of ice, it wouldn't really do much, but especially when the sun's out, you hear the dripping of water, the creaking and the cracking, and every now and then, like a big chunk will fall and it'll just like boom and reverberate through everything. So it's been really neat. You definitely don't want to go out on it right now because that would be terrifying. You could probably fall in. So we've just been safely watching it from the side. <laughs> After climbing down about 700 feet, we made the long trek back to the truck and set off to watch the sunset over the glacier. We were near the tree line and knew that the temperatures would drop significantly, but we just had to stay the night perched on this cliffside as this was one of the most spectacular views we had ever had. The glacier below us was clearly alive and would occasionally groan, pop, and crack, sometimes making ominous sounds like thunder through the valley. And once the few visitors to the overlook left, we seemed to have this entire glacier valley completely to ourselves. The night turned out very cold, with temperatures dropping into the teens in Fahrenheit and very high winds. But we managed to stay warm with the furnace cranked up. The morning once again brought warm sun and our last chance to soak in the beauty of this view. Our time here had been another highlight of our journey. However, the days of this trip were numbered as the temperatures continued to plummet day by day and we had already seen the threat of snow more than once. As we picked our way slowly down this mountainside, we thought ahead to the last few adventures we had planned that would complete our six-month journey in the north. 